Governor, it's my privilege to welcome you to the Mises Institute Brown Bag Seminar, and uh, my privilege to to uh, introduce you and welcome you. And I wanted to say a few words about you. Uh oh. <laughs> Governor and I have been friends for a long, long time. I think the first time I ever met him, he uh, was raised in Lynette, Alabama, but he had his grandparents here, and he used to come over as when we were about that high, and uh, and uh, met him first then, but. Uh, his father decided he needed a little more discipline, so he sent him off to a military school at Baylor. And uh, he was a great football hero there. He came to Auburn, followed in his father's footsteps, who his father was a great sports hero here. His father came on a uh, football scholarship and I think served in the best backfield Auburn ever had, uh, Freeman, James, Middleton, and Childress. And uh, he won all SEC and all American honors. He was uh, number 23 in the program, but number one in the hearts of the Auburn fans. <laughs> and uh, went on to play a, a little while in pro football, and then went back to Mobile and worked a little bit and began to work on an idea that's sort of the entrepreneurial dream of starting your own business from scratch. Came back to Opelika, uh, where everybody knew him and trusted him and believed in him, and were willing to put some money in an idea that he had. So he started a business in his basement. He and one employee, and it was an idea of how to make plastic barbells for the coming leisure time industry. Tried concrete first, and then it sort of rattled around, didn't it? Mm -hmm. But uh, he developed a process called Arbitron and started a virtually a one-man business and uh, built it into a multi-multi-million dollar international business and uh, extremely successful and then sold it, and uh, it's still headquartered in Oklahoma. But while he lived here, he and I got to be good personal friends and uh, talked a lot about politics. And I was a Republican trying to recruit him into the Republican Party to be a U.S. <laughs> senatorial candidate. Uh, but I can tell you from our discussions then and our discussions today that he is a rock-solid Jeffersonian and believes in very frugal, limited constitutional government. And uh, even more rare in political cir uh, circles, he's a person of absolute integrity. So those are rare qualities to find in the political field today, and he's got those. Uh, but most of my surprise came off office day on one day and said he's going to run for governor. And I, was, I was dumbfounded. He says, but I'm going to run as a Democrat. I said, oh, no. <laughs> 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 but uh, the poll showed a Republican could not get elected under any circumstances back in those days. He didn't. He chose not to run for a second term, but uh, ran again in 94 and uh, was the second Republican governor. But this time, it was on a level playing field. When Hunt was elected, it was a little skewed by the controversy in the Democrat Party. But uh, He won a uh, very hotly contested uh, Republican primary and then beat uh, uh, the incumbent governor, Jim Folsom, and uh, uh, really has, uh, has done a great job. And, and uh, well, The Republican Party has been uh, benefited greatly by you being the governor, and I think this year seeing the... Uh, Strong and Republican sweep uh, is partly attributed to you. And uh, he asked to speak to the Institute today on a subject that's real close to his heart that he and I have talked about a long, long time. And if you're going to have honest money, you need a gold standard. And so his his talk today is on the, uh, the moral case for the gold standard. So with that, Governor, we welcome you to the Mises Institute. Thank you. Thank you. John was very generous uh, in his comments, and uh, he has been a good friend. He is a lawyer, too. <laughs> Defense lawyer. <laughs> and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Lou Rockwell and Dean Foy and Mrs. Foy, two people that have a very warm place in my heart, going back uh, many, many years, and during my first administration, uh, Dean Ford came down and worked with us for several years. Uh, he's always been an inspiration to me, and if you get to know him as I have, he will be an inspiration to you. Dean, it's a great pleasure to just to run into you this morning. I, that's that's good, but more more of a pleasure to see Mrs. Ford, to be perfect. <laughs> I think. I, I think 
Ms. John has laid out the framework for our discussion. I'd, I'd like for you to uh, direct it more or less. And uh, <clears throat> what I might do, with your permission, is is to is to give a framework of discussion, and then really answer questions, and hopefully questions will lead to pretty good orientation of the issues. If that's that's permissible. Uh, you know, economics is is more than uh, the statistics. Uh, economics is a philosophy, or should be, or should have a philosophical base. I think uh, it's 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 a greater part of, of justice because if you coin the phrase, which is a new phrase, economic justice, that really is what our constitution was all about. Because a person doesn't isn't free to control the necessities of life, you're really not free. Uh, another another aspect of this institute that I like you 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 seemingly from the publications that I get and I read them all uh, every one of them uh, you. You are, you are forced to look at history, and I believe that is a great shortcoming in our society, it is a lack of knowledge of history and a love of history. Uh, I get into arguments with people sometimes on something as fundamental as the separation of powers doctrine, the absolute linchpin of our form of government, on which you're talking about. I'm very distressed about that. And I'm getting off of the subject, but I'm going to try to make next year National History Year. And I've got to get up here with the Dean of History and the same at the university. But we, 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 we have got to, we've got to reinstate that. And I'm not getting off on, on a tangent. But, you know, high tech, ever what that means is fine. And mathematics is fine. And I'm an engineer. And all of that is fine. And rockets and what have you. But without a base, a philosophical base, and a knowledge of history, it's, to my judgment, uh, of no, it just doesn't amount to anything. Uh, so let's let's blend let's let's blend some background and in thinking through through that scenario. Uh, one of the folks in my office put a article that I had written a couple of years ago that kind of, I think, will set the stage for our discussion. And, uh, Lou, I think you wrote a, uh, a piece here. There was an addendum that you or someone from here wrote, uh, uh relative to, to this particular issue. But I'm going to read it very, very quickly. And uh, this came in as an afterthought because I want us to get into economics and I want us to get into things like why is it that you got to have two paychecks today to live as well as you could off of one paycheck 25 years ago. And I want us to get into what the feds were doing, liquefying Wall Street when she fell out of bed in 1986 and a number of those things. But I want to set a set a background uh, for that. We'll certainly get around to the. Federal Reserve and all of their transgressions and sins and deceit that <laughs> we need to get into before we, before we get through here. Uh, very quickly, uh, vision isolated from the past is many blind spots. Churchill observed, uh, thus ended the great American Civil War. The North was plunged into debt. The South was ruined. The material advance in the United States was cast back from a spell. Reconstruction followed the ashes of war. Kind of brings us up from the revolutionary days to, to the Civil War. Young men and women ventured westward in America, connected by rail and telegraph, by infrastructure financed largely by foreign money. Railroad towns boomed, and off track communities faded. A process repeated a hundred years later by an interstate highway system. The nation was free of military involvement. Entrepreneurs and inventors created wealth and multiplied the strongest economy the world has ever known, from Standard Oil to Campbell Soup, DuPont, Bell, Telephone, Edison, Electric. The list grew from Bob Wire, the open house, steel furnace, electric bulb, and horseless carriage, to all discovered in Texas and Pennsylvania. The business was the business of America during this period. 
the South remains primarily an agrarian economy. What Churchill ap aptly dubbed the terrible 20th began with war, the Boxer Rebellion, the Boer War, World War I, uh, the Russian Revolution, then came the Roaring Twenties, the stock market crash, and the very Great Depression. I was born into that depression in 1934. My parents were public school teachers in Lynette, Alabama, which was a cotton mill town just a few miles east of here. Uh, teachers discipline and taught me to read and write and pay attention. They were corporal punishment in school for misbehaving. Corporal punishment at home for what happened at school. Thought it normal. <laughs> <laughs> I still do. My teachers uh, insisted I learn the basics, and I did. They gave or forced upon me the gift of literacy. Then somber words, World War II sent chills down our spines. Cotton mills ran around the clock seven days a week in the Chattahoochee Valley. Cub Scouts and myself included recycled tin cans flattened by hammers and axes, stacked them neatly in boxes and towed them to City Hall for collection. They would be melted down and tanks would be made to shoot Hitler. And Tojo, the memories of is as vivid what right? yesterday warns the jobs and an exodus of workers from the rural south, the Midwest and Northeast. This migration lasted two decades. The urban areas grew in prosper and then began to fall into decline. World War II ended with dropping an atomic bomb on Nagasaki, an event with which history has no intestine. It was a need for delivery system for nuclear warheads, which spurred the development of Redstone Arsenal and the economic growth of Huntsville, Alabama. Germany and Japan lay in ruins, remembering the aftermath of a harsh World War I armistice. Truman dealt generously with both nations. The economic resurgence of Germany and Japan would challenge the economic competitors of the United States and your generations and live to see that. The Marshall Plan proved America to be a great people with a giant heart. Its provisions led to restored Europe, which today is a major market for U.S. exports and one of our biggest competitors. The GI Bill provided education for two million veterans. Shopping their skills and intellect to meet the challenges of post-World War II boom would bring. One China became two. Taiwan quickly became a trade patron with the U.S. and China remains China. And when the Korean War ended in 1953, two buddies of mine, both old and not age 19, did not return home. It's a haunting feeling till this good day. Birmingham was a bustling steel town when I was at Auburn. Mobile had a viable maritime base, plants in Tuscaloosa and gas and couldn't produce enough tires. When I was a freshman in 52, pulp and paper industries were expanding. The Quad Cities were home to major aluminum plants, TBA and Redstone. Arsenal employed many people, including <laughs> my wife, to be Bobby Mooney, who was also a uh, freshman here. She was from Decatur, <clears throat> a rural part of Alabama. Eisenhower warned the nation of a too powerful military industrial complex. Debate over defense spending continues to this day as defense dollars impact the economy of Alabama and most every other state. As the 60s began, Alabama boasted the highest paid workforce of any southern state. Appetites for cars, homes, and most any other thing work a division were insatiable. Manufacturing was in a jump start. The employment rate in Lee County was less than 3%. Diversified products ran buses to Macon and Bullock Counties to procure enough workers to keep the plant operating 24 hours a day. Interstate highways changed transportation for Athens markets were shipped at reasonable prices by water, rail, and truck or combinations thereof. California mushroomed as migration continued its westward thrust. The Cuban crisis passed, and none of us knew how, just how close we'd come to eternity. Assassins, bullets killed JFK, MLK, RFK, and the Civil Rights Act codified equal rights for all. Prayer in public schools ruled unconstitutional. Paradoxically, just as you go black of Alabama wrote the majority opinion. We were introduced to a great society and told a faraway place like Vietnam. Kagal warned our leaders to stay out of Nam to no avail. Our government gave us a diet of guns and butter and national apoplexy. Japanese products appeared on retail stores, shelves, cottage industries like baseball gloves and toys. A man went to the moon as the stage was set for economic decline. The Vietnam War ended oil prices, skyrocketed, Watergate happened as more Japanese product products penetrated U.S. markets in mass. The decade ended with double-digit interest rates, inflation, and unemployment in Alabama. Unemployment exceeded 15%. That was 1980 my, during my first term. When I became governor of Alabama in January of 79, the coal industry in Alabama employed more than 20,000 miners. By the mid-80s, fewer than 10,000 miners worked in our state. The industry had been priced out of rural markets by foreign competition. 
Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980. The economy boomed, as did the national debt for Presidents George Washington and Jimmy Carter. America ran up a trillion dollar debt. From President Reagan to Bush, the debt grew to $4 trillion. The U.S. government milked taxpayers out of billions of dollars with HUD and SML scandals. The 90s brought trouble in the Middle East, and a coalition of allies kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, using a lot of American muscle. Bill Clinton was elected president in November 1992. The sign was reported to hung on his Little Rock campaign headquarters, read, This economy is stupid. The pundits claim to the job issue. Alabama Department of Industrial Relations reported this summer that the jobless rate was a low 5%. Economics of states change constantly. The Rust Belt recovers from economic doldrums. Florida and California to some belt states experience hard times. From USA Today's National News work, December 3, 1992, California is told it cannot issue IOUs. California finance officials who say the state could run out of money in April were told by a federal judge when they can't again issue IOUs to pay state workers. Judge Burrell said paying workers with paper that isn't immediately negotiable in case of its equivalent violates the Fair Labor Standards Act. The plan st- state plans to fill state workers sued after they were paid in depression-style script during a July budget deadlock between Governor Wilson and the legislature. The state issued $3.6 billion in IOUs. New Hampshire, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut have all seen better days. Remember, this was written in 1992 when some of these states were in a uh, state of depression. Louisiana and Texas prosper in an oil boom. They suffer in a glut. Uh, eight southeastern states were ranked by per capita income this year. This was written in 92 or 94, forgotten which. Florida, 23,000, Georgia, 21, North Carolina, 21, Tennessee, 21, Alabama, 19, 1, South Carolina, 18, 9, Kentucky, 18, 8, Mississippi, 17. You see North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, South Carolina, very, very close. Florida's number one rank is the obvious result of southern migration of huge numbers of middle to upper or income retired persons. Georgia's top rank stems from 30 years of sustained economic growth in the greater Atlanta area. Uh, we often hear Alabama has superior natural resources and waterways. Therefore, therefore, her problem is a total lack of political leadership for the past 100 years, and we must change our image. Such political cliches are hyperbole. You think about that statement, natural resources compared with what or whom, the Mississippi River? Coal deposits in Kentucky and Montana, oil reserves in Texas, Tammany Hall of the Louisiana Kingfish, if you want to have <laughs> politicians. Cloudy, it is accurate to say we are blessed with a good environment, so are many other states. Type and quality political leadership generate conflicting opinions, images of fuzzy. Comparisons made out of context belie the truth, especially in economics. Most troubling is a common concern we do share for a generation of young people who are first to have a lesser economic opportunity than their parents. Today it takes two paychecks to purchase what one did 25 years ago. The economic dearth caused by long-term inflation is a direct result of the United States government monetary policy since 1964 by both Republican and Democratic administrations in Washington. Inflation enslaves wage earners. The harder he or she works, the tougher the ends to meet. History speaks clearly. External forces that drive economic changes are markets, natural resources, war, and climate. Internal forces are political, laws, infrastructure, taxes, and inflation, and capital, and interest. Even so, the greatest catalyst for social advancement and human initiative on a literate society kind of brings you up to date for the last hundred years very quickly. (laughs) (laughs) And... uh, uh, I think that the question I would have is uh, to you is going back to uh, to the late seventies uh, when we had extraordinary inflation, high interest rates, how those interest rates have come down, but they really haven't come down uh, when you look at them. Uh, today's today's interest rate schedule. Uh, is is a, is a confusing thing. Uh, 
discount rate three and a half percent to three percent, prime rate eight and a half percent, yet banks are paying five percent on CDs. That's that's a mix that uh, we know. I've never seen before in my life, John. And uh, it drives, I think, money into a very speculative pot, wherever that speculation may be. And here we see the government more and more trying to subsidize speculation. And I don't know where that's going to lead us, but I think we are fundamentally breaking a lot of uh, a lot of uh, principles of the past. Uh, I would like to to uh, as the first issue is talk about monetary policy. Uh, we know that in our Constitution, it deals with the concept of hard currency. That means stability in something that will hold its value down through the years. Then we know we lived with the gold standard until President Nixon eliminated in the 1960s. Now we have a federal reserve that I think is more political than the United States Congress. And uh, uh, I think that is an issue that we uh, we need to talk about. And I would start by asking these questions. Is the statement that it takes two paychecks to live as well today as it did on one paycheck 20, 25 years ago? Is there some of the truth to that? Or is that just an old wife's tale? And the other how would an individual coming into young adulthood view their economic opportunity as we go into the 21st century compared with their parents? Well, those two good questions to start with. Well, they're, they're two very big questions, actually. Um, and I, I appreciate a lot of what you, uh, you had to say here. Uh, I think it's true that Americans don't know their history very well. But one of the things that we find is that most people can't make the connection between their history and the downward spiral and going off the gold standard. And this break with, uh, with uh, gold money or commodity-based money is, is something that uh, most academics, most uh, educated people don't make that connection. They don't see the cause and the effect of the downward Spiral that you refer to, and the fact that uh, it does take uh, two paychecks to equal the same uh, standard of living of the 1950s. I think that uh, the statistics uh, indicate that the real wage rate in the economy, the real average person working in a factory or in a store, is making as much or less than what they were doing in the 1970s. But the inflation has uh, has covered all that up. It's, uh, it's it creates a mirage of improvement because your wages are going up, but your purchasing power that you get from your wages has been eroded away because we haven't been on a, on a gold standard system, which was a driving incentive to the two paychecks. Exactly. You know, uh, you know if you if you if you can't purchase uh, the food, clothing, shelter, education, so on and so forth, uh, with a one paycheck, then the natural inclination is to send the wife out into the workforce and, uh, and try to supplement that in some way, or to try to work a second job or to do moonlighting and that sort of thing, because that certainly is the case uh, today. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about it, and let's talk about it in this vein. Here's, here's, a, here's a terrible thing. This could. Uh, if the government sent in the police to take your furniture, to take your home, or to confiscate things, you get very mad. That's right. <laughs> mad. And it would be taken seriously and not tolerated. I mean, as you can know, some of the governmental actions lately. Uh, <laughs> where some of the law enforcement groups got out of whack out of the West there a couple of times. And, uh, the, the, the reaction was, was terrible. The fellow with his name Jewel up in Atlanta that the FBI accused of setting a bomb. 
we are upset about that. And you're reading the newspapers, how horrible it is. And it endangers our freedom and our opportunity. Uh, but I can't get anybody angry about this monetary policy. How are we going to put some, some zing in that, that issue? Yeah, John? Roosevelt uh, sent the police out and confiscated all the gold. Mm-hmm. He made the people actually turn in gold. It's no different than, I mean, he wasn't foreclosing on a mortgage. He just said, you've got to turn in your gold. He took my gold, please. I mean, it's, <laughs> abs- it's absolutely amazing to me that the American people tolerated that and put up with it. Uh, just to take your personal <coughs> property uh, just by an edict. And that was... Uh, that was sort of the beginning and the end for, for any semblance of, of money uh, being valued. Well, there was a movement here a few years ago in the Congress, wasn't there, to go back on a some kind of metallic standard or a, a gold standard? Sort of by mixed, mixed, yeah, mixed currency yeah. thing. Uh, <clears throat> they got mine before, but they're not going to get it next. <laughs> uh, the only conversation I have had with uh, Richard Nixon which was an alternate delegate in 68. We were in this long lines, and we could go speak to him for something like 15 seconds and pass on. So I was, there had been a rumor that he would, uh, was, might believe in wage and price control. And uh, so I decided that would be my question. So I said, uh, uh, Mr. Nixon, uh, are there any circumstances under which you would institute wage and price controls? Absolutely not. And he said, he said, you know, it doesn't work for the long as the Diocletian. And I was surprised he knew who Diocletian was. And uh, then he comes up in 1971, closes the gold window, absolutely, right. puts on wage and price controls, and announces in a television interview that he's a Keynesian economic supporter. And so in 72, I refused to vote for him as a delegate and let the alternate vote. But that was the issue that, that sewed it up with me and Nixon was the wage and price controls and the gold one. Well, we can, we can talk about it. What, what, what do you think about the Federal Reserve? If we don't get a gold standard, what do you say is going to happen? What, what are the, what are the effects that you can identify today? relative to the inflation that we have seen over the last 10 or 12 years. Tangible. Can anybody think of anything tangible? Yes, sir. I'm just going to uh, emphasize your point about the uh, two paychecks required to support one family. And this uh, seems to me the central government, or what we like to think of as the northern government, has done a lot more to the American people over the years, but the fact that it's driven the wives and mothers of America into the workforce and left children to be raised by strangers in daycare centers it seems to me a crime of unbelievable proportions. And who knows what the social significance of this, but it, it, uh, it's just building up terrible things for the future. And um, I think you're exactly right that this is a way to get people morally indignant about the sort of monetary policy we've had ever since Nixon, uh, this uh, perpetual inflation and destruction of the standards of living. Yes, sir. The, the cost push inflation is something I think no one's talking about. To give you a tangible example to answer your question, I worked for Ford Motor Company for quite some time and watched the, uh, the cost of your vehicle because of meeting EPA regulations go from about $65 in 1968 to about $965 in 1978 to about $2,800 in 1995. Now, this is additional money you're spending supposedly to get cleaner air, and that's of a, a dubious uh, uh, belief anyway if they're really making the air any better off, at least with the later regulations. Certainly the first ones generated some, some positive <coughs> things in the economy. So when the government comes along and forces you to buy things that you might not voluntarily buy, that's why I think many folks are spending more and more money to get less and less. One of the problems, and let me give you an example, and I've thought about that often, and the manufacturers did not oppose it. Very much. Early on. That I, I recall they did not oppose it. And I, I kept wondering why. And I, I, I don't want to be cynical, but if I'm going to put a car down a production line and the government is going to require me to put 
three or four, five, or ten items on there, that same car. And all I got to do is put it on there and put a fat profit on it, and then you got to buy. That's not a bad situation. That's <laughs> communist <laughs> capitalism, isn't it? Sure. Uh-huh. Who has a patent on a catalytic converter? That's right. GM. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. So I'm, I'm just saying there's a cost push element here as well as sort of the demand side. The first paycheck I had when I left this great institution was $500 a month working for Caterpillar Practical. And that was enough money to get married and have children and buy a home and pay for it. And I was richer then than I've ever been since that time. <laughs> Five hundred dollars. You never forget your first paycheck. Yes, sir. No, but Father, how do you respond to this? When I present what's just happened here to my peers, I'm told <coughs> one, they have far more than they ever had when they were young, and secondly, their kids have far more than they ever had when they were kids. <coughs> You're saying everybody's poorer off, and all my peers say we're all better off. Let me think about that. Well, that's, I mean... Uh, debt comes into play. Yeah, uh, debt comes into play. I would not say, I would not say that economically, uh, economically, my sons are better off than... I don't think they're as well off as my generation. One of the insidious things about inflation is that it does benefit some people. Mm-hmm. Some people are actually helped by inflation. Specul- speculative speculative ventures are helped by inflation. Well, Real estate the, being one. The number one beneficiary, of course, is the government itself. They're taking in all of these resources from the economy and using them themselves. But also, you mentioned, you know, what are the tangible effects? of the current inflation uh, because it doesn't seem to come out in the CPI as much. But of course, inflation can come out anywhere in the economy. It doesn't have to come out in uh, tied detergent prices. It can come out in stock prices or automobile prices or land prices or uh, timber prices or what, whatever it happens to be. Uh, you know, the in- inflation can pop out in the economy anywhere. and It doesn't have to be in lettuce and in grocery store items. Uh, it can be in the stock market. I think that um, the the group of people in the economy uh, who are the primary owners mm-hmm. of stock in the economy, the top level, are doing fairly well by this uh, speculative bubble. But it's the people, uh, the two thirds of the popu- American population, who don't own any stock, who don't ha- or have any pension uh, stock-based pension plans. Um, those are the ones that are complaining. Those are the ones where the paycheck is not. Making it, not getting it there. Yeah, let me get back to your question there. You you ask a good question, and I didn't I didn't I didn't really address it uh, as as well as it needs to be addressed. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I can't convince my peers. They all think it's great. Because isn't part of the problem that your peers have been the recipients of a vast transfer of wealth? I mean, one of the reasons that they may be actually be better off is that young people are, you know, being taxed at fantastic rates to support them. Again, something that started with Nixon. I mean, the whole, that's when Social Security and Medicare really began to thrive as a transfer programs. And um, so there's that aspect to it, too. No, that one works, you know, and nobody will talk about it. We get on something else. <laughs> Because I have really benefited, and I'm really going to get them for tens of thousands more in the next few years as I go through the fancy operations that I might not get, you know, if you weren't going to give it to me. <laughs> well, uh, I remember this figure from a couple of days ago because I was, uh, uh, the federal, uh, the federal, Dollars that come into our Medicaid in Alabama, and it's for nursing homes only. Nursing home, nursing homes only. Went from a 1990 from about a, a 60 to 70 million 
for last year to half a billion. Uh, the difference, the difference in the rate it went up over those five or six years and the rate of medical inflation, which was twice the rate of the consumer price index at the end, if you do it on a graph, was $200 million. So when I first saw that, I said, my God, we must have built a uh, 10 times more nursing home beds. You know how many we built more? Zero. It's constant. Those things have gone from ten or $12,000 per year to right at $29,000 per year. The nursing home operators are getting rich. Filthy rich. Got to be. And that is, that is the, the best prime example of what a, 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 a national government, of what a national government can do when it, when, when the people are overtaxed, there's jillions of dollars coming in. They add to that the debt in the deficit. And it's, it's, it's hard to stop it. I mean, the thing feeds on itself. And I, I believe it is, uh, I believe it is out of control. Uh, thankfully, the President and Congress are talking about stopping it. And you hear more talk about a balanced budget amendment. But, uh, and that example that I just gave you is just one of many relative to the way the federal government spends dollars. Uh, and most people accept it. I mean, most, I, I don't find many people that turn down gifts from the government. The only group that I know that will not accept major increases are our four-year schools. No matter how much money you want to give them, they all send it all back. Governor, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, one of the things we have one of the problems, though, with that there's uh, this, uh, I don't want to say image, but, for example, I, I think that's probably one of ten people in the whole country watching the vice presidential debate. And... Uh, <laughs> Al Gore made uh, one of these snide comments about gold standard, and I think he said some of the fact that Jack Kemp had, had supported the gold standard at one time, and boy, that's stupid, and ha, ha, ha. And, of course, Kemp kind of backed off a little bit, but it seems to me that for years, well, really since 1896, at least in the Democratic Party, and the Republicans got on the bandwagon later on, but that politicians have always beaten on the gold standard, and I think confused people a lot to what... Uh, to what goes on, to where if you uh, you know if you find yourself thinking that we should have a gold standard, it's like uh, uh, it's equating it with believing in seg you know in segregation or uh, uh, you know or that uh, um, women shouldn't be allowed to vote, you know that kind of kind of thing. And I was wondering how do you, how do you get around that? I don't know. Uh... The gold standard, per se, is an issue unto itself that the average person has no reason to think about. And how do you get him to connect that with his financial problems <clears throat> is a very good question. Uh, a, a knowledge of history would help. Back in the late 70s, during your first administration, you were allied, if I remember right, with Governor King, Massachusetts, as governors in favor of gold. Can you right. tell us a little bit about that? And are there any prospects for something similar to that now? Are there other governors who share your views? I do not know. I, I have not had an opportunity. I, I just hadn't discussed that with any of them. You've got some conservative... Uh, when I say conservative, I, I, I use it in the construction sense. Uh, uh, governors, uh, Sunquist, Tennessee, I think, is a fine person like, uh, uh, that would, would understand what we're talking about. Uh, the young governor over in South Carolina, Beasley, uh, and others, but 
most governors will say, well, the states have, we have to balance our budget. By constitution, every state has to balance our budget. So they are concerned that the federal government doesn't seem to be able to do that. And a balanced budget and a gold standard, uh, you know, it, it isn't exactly the same. Uh, no, I have never heard, I have never heard any, 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 I don't think I've ever heard a, a political figure seriously, seriously discuss or advocate a return to a gold standard or a partial gold standard. <laughs> because when you say, ask them, how would you do it? If you did, I couldn't tell you how to do it. I mean, where would you get the gold? How? What would the price of it be? You could be. I'd, if I said right now, I am proposing a gold standard, and and the, you know the the question: How would you implement it if it happened? Well, I wouldn't. I, I could not answer that question for you. Well, I wouldn't know how to do that. I don't know where we are. I mean, what the, what the stockpiles of gold, gold are, what the price should be. Was gold set up on that four hundred dollars an ounce of back? Uh, when we went off of it, it was thirty some odd dollars. Well, it, it was you know valued at thirty five dollars an ounce officially, and uh, when it was illegal to own it, the big prediction was that well, if you legalize it, it's going to go down to six dollars an ounce. The chairman of the uh, the banking Commission said that. And so, what was it, 1972 or 73, it became legal and could own it. So it's gone from $35 an ounce, it went up to $850 an ounce, and that's back down to 485 All right, gold has been around $400 an ounce for the last five, six years. Very little fluctuation. The Dow Jones has gone from, what, 2000 to... It was five or six a week ago. I don't know what it is now. Six, 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 so you you get into some uh, you you get into some pretty serious economic theory. I I can't I can't relate that. I Didn't, mean, uh, Murray Rothbard write to that, and uh, I'm not sure what year, but I think he he said if you wanted to go on the gold standard this year. Then I think gold would be worth three thousand a year or something at the time he said that. I don't know how long ago that was, but you would uh, you'd have to see where you are and, and what it's worth and, and declare that that's where you, you know your dollars are based on the unit of gold. What would it do to loans, interest rates? I mean, yeah, I think we need to keep talking about it because a thing like a gold standard probably will never be reinstated unless we are in trouble. It will probably take a crisis of some type mm -hmm. to make that a reality. I think you're right. The, uh, you know, the founding fathers who set gold in the Constitution, the reason they set gold in the Constitution is that they had had the bad experience, the crises of hyperinflation during the Revolution. The, the Continentals became worthless. That's right. And the, all that paper money, they lost a lot of money. They lost everything. You know which country in the industrial, which industrial country today is the most sensitive to inflation by far? Germany. Germany. They were not even a close second. <clears throat> you see, they got bit in the 30s. And out of that came Brother Adolf. And they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they are the most sensitive government in the, in the country to, to inflation. Inflation, and then you link it to Adolf Hitler, and all of a sudden it really—all <laughs> of a sudden it really matters that you know you need sound money. Despots down through the years. I mean, part of of uh, of our early heritage came from not wanting a king to get in your pocketbook, because kings had done that. I mean, that's how they even in British English kings, the French were horrible about. It. Uh, but I don't know how we going to get back there. I think from a practical standpoint, what we need to do most of all is uh, is try to balance our budget and reduce taxes well, same, at the same time. There, there are uh, some some schemes out there like uh, asset-backed uh, 
securities where banks today are trying to expand their own credit. Uh, and this asset-backed security is just one example of many different ways that, uh, that banks and others are, are trying to pyramid more credit upon uh, our monetary base. Do you see anything that states can do to try to prevent this sort of pyramidization of the money supply? The only vehicle you would have to to restrict banks would be through the uh, banking department, and it would require additional legislation to give give you more authority because banks are pretty well regulated by the federal federal law. Uh, I think the banks. I think the, the big banks, the central banks, I, I think the way they got bailed out from a few years ago, and I think it is a disgrace, and there, there were very few headlines about it. The Fed simply dropped the discount rate to the banks, cut the cost in half. They raise the interest, and when you cut your cost in half, or if somebody cuts your cost in half for you and doubles the price, if you can't make money in those circumstances, <laughs> you're in trouble. And what that meant, that the American people bailed out the banks on a massive scale, and there was very little written about that. I, and I could not understand that. I didn't see when the press didn't pick it up. I didn't hear any politicians talking about it, because it's hard. It, it, it's hard for the, for the average person to understand that. But they did, didn't it? They sure did. I mean, if I got up and made a speech and said, all right, the banks, your bank, your local bank, your friendly local bank, yeah. <laughs> it's taking you to the cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Alan Greenspan wrote some of the best articles I ever read on gold back in the 60s. And I thought then, I said, boy, if this guy could get in a key government <laughs> We would really be a good ship. And, uh, it, uh, you know, but once you get in there, the interest is different. It's, uh, the, uh, the government doesn't want a gold standard. Now he's a government official. Yeah, they, they, you know, the, the uh, bites got him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, it was Greenspan who said, again, back in the period you're talking about, he, he said putting... Federal government in charge of money is like putting a penny in the fuse box. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> power, is, power is a very uh, power is a very corruptible, corrupting influence, and probably uh, Greenspan is the most powerful person in the world today, just by little variance in decisions that are made there. Now, if we knew our history. We would know what Andrew Jackson almost did to the central bankers. And he understood it. The Madison was a, was the first lamb on a 12 inch tree and a rope. And that was, <laughs> that was his feelings on monetary policy that stole from the paychecks. Of the average American. And everybody knew it. That's why they didn't take it any further. He would shot them. There ain't no question about it. <laughs> but we have lost our ability to take such decisive action for some reason. I guess it's, we're most civilized, John. Well, you know, to say uh, you can't make a political issue out of it today it may be true, but it was, uh, that was a man in the street issue back with Jefferson and Hamilton. That's right. I mean, and, and uh, Jackson, I mean, people understood it because of, I suppose, the more recent history of what happened with the Continentals. And they'd all been burned by paper money. And I would assume that we, like you say, we're going to eventually reach a point where it's a crisis that people understand. It. What you'd like to try to do is prevent that crisis from occurring. I think I read when Reagan first ran in the uh, primary in New Hampshire that he wanted to advocate a gold standard and all his handlers talked him out of it and said, no, no, don't say anything about it. It's just, uh, I guess people don't understand it enough right now. I wish y'all would write some good statistics on what inflation has done to the average American. That would be good to see. 
I mean, I, I know it, and you get it in bits and pieces. But a uh, a short paper on it in layman's language would be an interesting endeavor. Well, one of the uh, one another one of these tangible effects of inflation and easy money, paper money, that we've seen in recent years, and I think that. It, just in the last couple of years, actually since Greenspan has been uh, having breakfast with Clinton, I think, um, <laughs> is uh, that the American people are running up huge credit card debts, and they're taking out what they call magic checkbooks from the bank yeah. now, which are home equity loans, where you're taking all of the equity out of your house, and you can write a check for anything, cruise to the Caribbean, or a new car, or a uh, new bass, anything, or whatever. And uh, so the American people have gone on an orgy of credit, using bringing up credit cards and these magic checkbooks. And, um, you know, it's not just the government debt that's being pumped up to astronomical levels, but it's actual American debt. And people are uh, going bankrupt, and they're losing their homes. And, right. and right now we're in a good economy with low unemployment. And if that, if, if and when that ever starts to turn down, and, and that's the, you know, surest law of economics is that what goes up must come down. Um, you know, when we hit hard times, a lot of these credit cards and magic checkbooks and so on are going to be really put a pinch on uh, <coughs> Americans more so uh, than we already are. If public awareness, if the stage can be set and more and more people understand what's coming and the reasons for it, then you really set the stage for for change. Uh, to move along, if you want to talk about any other issues, or taxes is one and the cost of government. I mean, the cost of government is ridiculous. Uh, when I was in office the first time, Alabama had a population of 4 million people plus. Got the same population day. Had... Uh, probably uh, more people in K through 12 and we had about 30,000 state employees when I left office had adequate fine office space my first time I mean it was just just fine you go to Montgomery today it is a high rent district in Alabama if not the world massive Fancy office space that is, it just makes you nauseous when you see it because it wasn't needed. And it's so far from early American government what it was all about. And, uh, it's something about government that expands. I don't know what it is, but it's something about the nature of it. That will first take care of itself, protect its turf, and then expand and expand and expand. Somebody from up here ran for the set. You're a libertarian, you have a libertarian. Yeah, right there. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my seminar. <laughs> uh, I saw that ad that you had. You know what I told my wife? Hire that guy. In the morning, bring him to Montgomery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking for a job because they're cutting the budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, you serious? You mean what you said in that? Uh? In, the, uh, in the ad? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I need to talk with you. <laughs> <laughs> He's on my right. No crazy, no crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, taxes taxes are federal state taxes it's true people work about six months out of the year to pay all those taxes that's, that's true a lot of hidden costs in government uh, in state government one of the hidden, uh, biggest hidden costs is French benefits uh, it's, it runs 50% in the state of Alabama Pay somebody hundred dollars, cost you one hundred fifty dollars. Our salary payroll, straight salary in the highway department, is a hundred million dollars. Total payroll is one hundred fifty-three million dollars. 
you, that can't go wrong right now, right now in the general fund. If we don't do anything, it automatically grows five to six percent a year based on built in payroll benefits. We don't touch it. It grows an automatic five percent a year. I mean, it can't, it can't, it's got to stop. What, uh, what you find yourself, you, 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 I think you have a duty to recognize it and then the duty to try to do something about it. Uh, uh, for several reasons. Number one, you got a moral responsibility to the taxpayers. And from a humanitarian standpoint, we got a lot of wonderful state merit employees, but if this thing keeps going, the days come, somebody's going to take a meat axe. If we act now, we got a chance to affect a halfway soft landing. Probably the same with uh, education. Well, we've got quite a 14 or 15 four year school. 30 odd two year school fun keeps going so be glad to discuss those issues or any other issues with you that you might want to ask me before I get out of here well the uh, the, the cost of government is something that people just don't understand when I talk about public education in Auburn or doesn't matter it could be any school system around the country <coughs> Uh, they really feel that it's a, a free good that people just go and, and it, it just expands and, and that's okay because no one ever actually has to write out a check or pay the bills. But it surprises people to learn that the average cost of a student going to Auburn High School or Auburn Elementary School is twice the cost, more than twice the cost of what it costs to send a child to Lee Scott Academy or to a private school. And they're just flabbergasted that the uh, that the public schools actually cost more than twice as much to educate a student of an equal quality, a relatively equal quality, to compare to a private school. They just nobody mentions that, and so nobody knows that, and nobody actually has to take the money out of their pocketbook. And so um, it comes from someplace, but they just don't know where it's coming from. What's the answer to that? Last year, we spent, we spent our average expenditure in public education in 1995 was $4,000. We have $4,000, of which the state puts in about 60 to 70 percent. Locals would be uh, 20 to 30 percent. The feds, this is statewide, would be 10 percent. Of course, most of that is into your, your poor schools. There's very little correlation between dollars spent per child and performance on the SAT scores. Uh, we, we went up 20 to $4,500 this 96, which was, so we had a 12.5% increase. Teacher pupil ratio, classroom teachers certified, statewide average is about 17 to 1. Uh, I won't get into a lot that's being done in, uh, uh, K through 12, but I think we are making progress. I think in uh, uh, Dr. Richardson and Dr. Morton, Dr. Baker, we got the best management team in the United States. I believe that, and y'all been reading about it in the newspapers where they're challenging everything that walks, and that's thirty years late. But I'm I'm very delighted with the we had to codify it in the law. We literally had to codify it in the law, and uh, uh, once it was and. Uh, that happened, and you got some management that at executing. Uh, and on that issue, which I have always thought was a, such an important issue, my experience has been where I have found a strong principal, a strong superintendent, you normally have a good school system. If you don't have that, you're in trouble. But no matter what they do, or how good the teacher is, or how much money goes there, uh, until parents, until parents get back in this loop again, pretty strong. We're not going to have a society we want. And I don't know. Government cannot raise a child. I am convinced of that. Totally convinced. Might help out some. But, but, but the dry, that's, that seems to be something that's cropped up in our society. I have a hard time dealing with that. Just, it's just tough to deal with from a governmental level. But I'm doing all the talking. So, ask some questions, uh, make some comments. Yes, sir. Think about a flat tax, no loopholes, and a standard deduction. 
I love it. Does it stand a snowball's chance in Hades? Or? Uh, I think it, it, it could be very saleable. Uh, you know, one of the Republican candidates used that totally. And uh, uh, I thought it was credible. Uh, but I think it, it, it will, uh, it, it will take time, but yes, I, I, I think a flat tax is an idea whose time is close. I think Steve Forbes was right on target. Uh, he came down, uh, before we ever started and, and had a long chat with him about it. And I thought he did a good job. I thought his campaign uh, I, I, I thought his strategy was was not s- s- sound. I mean, you cannot one run for president on a on, on one issue which nobody understands. As, as, as good as it is, I thought if he could have blended it a little bit, he may have a better campaign. But I think he got the point out. I thought he made a tremendous contribution. Yes, I think a flat tax, but that would uh, that would take a a cut out of a that would take a cut out of a lot of professions and work <laughs> in, in this country it really would and you know that's another question I want to ask y'all I read a book what's the name of that book uh, it was a futuristic projection and the author spoke down and he was down in Montgomery when President Bush was down there a couple of weeks ago or I can't think of the book. But he projected a lot of about the economy. What was the name of that book, John? Four or five years ago, the book came out. He's an economist? Yeah. Well, he's a historian, but it was a book primarily about the economy. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, Mega Trends. <laughs> yeah, he was in Nesbitt. Uh, he, he was in Montgomery a couple of weeks ago. I had a chance to chat with him just for a minute. But in that, he said, one of the, the, could it be that the 21st century, the question will be, how do you make jobs? We've always thought in terms of providing service and making products. Never thought about it in terms of how do you make jobs. And I, well, I, I, I see that, uh, you know, we got a lot of, a lot of lawyers today. <laughs> we got a lot of lawsuits. They're litigious. We got a lot of uh, welfare and looking after children and abuse, and that drives an a, a industry within itself. When I was governor the first time in uh, in Montgomery, we had two lobbyists. We had the AEA, and we had Farm Bureau. That was it. Today, you got hundreds of them everywhere. Even the four-year schools are hiring lobbyists out of public funds. Figure that one out. That is a that is an industry, and when these industries get their hooks into the government uh, cash flow, it's hard to get them out. And they're good people. I mean, accountants. I, I have service a lawyer, but uh, <laughs> accountants. I mean, think of what would happen to people who prepare tax forms and give tax advice if it was two plus two equal four, John. <laughs> well, you know, Governor, we have uh, seminars in here and we give them papers all the time where we show that in history, every time the government's been cut back, they've reduced taxes and they've reduced regulation and they've balanced their budget or they've gone on to a gold standard and they've made economic reforms. And sometimes that means tossing a bunch of bureaucrats out onto the streets that a market economy will create jobs. If you get that entrepreneur some freedom, like yourself, well, in your own case, where you have a, 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 the freedom to do and the freedom to hire without all of these federal encumbrances, federal regulations and taxes, um, and all of the new uh, higher minimum wages and Family Leave Act and all of these things, the entrepreneur can only do one or two things at a time, and you, you're you just not really set up to start a new business and deal with all of these regulations uh, and so I think we, true. we got rid of the bureaucrats who were regulating us to death and taxing us to death 
that we could then put those regulators and those bureaucrats to work with the good old-fashioned American entrepreneurship. I, I think you're 100% right, but I won't keep hearing you say it because I fight the bureaucrats every day. And they, <laughs> <laughs> they, they wear you down. They wear you down. Yeah. Well, yes. obviously, too. Yeah. Um, I think part of the thing is it's, it's very hard for you to say, okay, we're going to lower the taxes, we're going we're to abolish the Fed. I mean, these things, it's very hard for, for, for us as economists. I mean, we're not the greatest predictors in the world. Um, it's hard for us to come to you and say, look, this is exactly what's going to happen because it's probably not going to happen. Um, there, there, there are other things that happen that, that, you know, that is. I mean, we just can't predict the, the perfect outcome. The thing is, I think with the rumors that we always have the, the moral high ground that when you throw a bureaucrat out on the street, and fire him, and he comes and says, look, my, my poor family doesn't, you know, I don't have a job now. To, to raise my family, I mean, I would just look at him and say, "Well, yeah, I'm I'm glad you lost your job because now, now some 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 family where the wife is having to work to pay for your salary, now she can go home, or or the husband can go home, whoever whoever, whoever wants to stay home, they can stay home and raise their children." Um, with the Fed, um, it's hard to predict the outcome of what would happen if you abolish the Fed. But one thing I would tell people is is um, Someone's got your hand, their hand in your pocket, and I'm going to get rid of it for you. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think life's going to be better because of it? <laughs> that's right. I mean, that's that's what I find uh, uh, the average person is more and more receptive to understanding that than they were 10 years ago. I think it's the moral. I, th- I, th- I, think, I think if this momentum is not building in your generation, we're in, we in trouble. Real trouble. I think that public perception is very important. I have a patient in West nursing unit of Wesley Terrace, and when we first, I first inquired, the cost was twenty six hundred a month. And later I said, "Can you confirm this?" She said, "No, it's gone up to twenty seven something." She said, "Clinton gave us all a raise." <laughs> <laughs> Clinton gave. I mean, this is perception, and that's what has to be followed. You're right, and it's, it's taken me a long time. And this, and this group is you, fighting it. Let yeah. me tell you, they're great. Uh, I agree. Yes, sir. Governor, there's one other tax that we have on us, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but uh, uh, and you tried to do something last year in a special session, and that deals with uh, uh, the tort system in Alabama. And I was wondering, I know that after this last campaign, which the uh, complaint, most people complained it was an ugly campaign, but it seemed to me the only people making it ugly were the trial lawyers and, and Kenneth Ingram. Um, because they were the ones, they're the ones who funded that campaign, but and also Gene Reese's campaign. But uh, now we hear this. Well, what we need to do is appoint judges, and instead of having these ugly campaigns, isn't that really an attempt by the trial lawyers to slip their people in the back door with the idea we're going to be high-minded now? When in fact it was the trial lawyers that brought the thing down the mud in the first place. Uh, no, I think there are a lot of well-intended people that think uh, offices for the judiciary ought to be selected a little different. Uh, I'm inclined to think that for circuit judges that uh, they should stay just like they are. I'm inclined to think that for appellate judges, I got an open mind. Not sure yet. But what you want a judge to do, what you're supposed to want a judge to do, you want him to interpret the law or the Constitution and use his best ability to define it as to the meaning that the people that wrote it intended or the Constitution. Now, what we've had, we've had a large dose of judicial activism the last 40, 50 years which has skewed a lot of things. People actually think if the court rules in a way that they favor, then the court is doing its, its duty. And uh, back to the history, uh, George Washington in his farewell address devoted uh, some language to pointing out that if you change like that, it may appear good at first. But it's the way most free governments come down. And uh, uh, I don't know. I hadn't. I have not made a final decision. I, for circuit judges, before I would uh, appellate courts, 
you could make a case that the uh, governor ought to appoint the Senate confirm. That's how we do it, the federal system. Yet make that judge run for retention at the end of every six years. The problem is it, it's a lot. It's a lot. Once you're appointed, if let's say the judge turns out like Kenneth Ingram, who's just uh, just a lackey for the trial lawyers, <laughs> it's much harder to get rid of him if he's got to just run for a, a up yes, for retention. Uh, yeah, the retention, and it just seems to me that uh, uh, it's off. It's very hard to predict what somebody's going to do until they're actually <clears> on the court. <throat> but this so-called Missouri plan. Uh, which I heard a judge in Tennessee years ago call it the Russian plan, um, <laughs> that the problem is once the person is there, it is extremely difficult to get a bad judge. It's harder to get a bad judge off if nobody's running against them. You got to, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Florida has that system. Yeah, Tennessee does too. California has it. They got rid of Rose Bird. But yeah, they do. But they had to spend a lot of resources to do it. Now, we had some interesting, we've got, we put some interesting law on the books that, Public had picked up on yet. One, one, one of them was in, uh, in uh, January 1, 1996. Uh, any, any judge, uh, any appellate judge that has received in aggregate over $4,000 from the lawyer and all the law firm, all any clients or agents of the law firm, and the list goes on. Then the other lawyer make him accuse himself. Now, <laughs> that, that hadn't hit him yet, John. But <laughs> oh, I, I don't see that is the law. Well, now, uh, Judge, uh, who won this? Judge uh, C. Uh, Harold. I don't know what his contribution list is, but I'm afraid a lot of folks in the business community that are going to be disappointed. He don't have to. But it works both ways, and, and what you find out. You get these sides that they that, that they both have an economic interest. They lose sight, totally lose sight of the law, and they want the judges to construe the law to fit their interest. That ain't what a judge is supposed to do. A judge is supposed to construe the law as the legislators intended it, or as the Constitution intended it, and that's the problem. That is the problem. No. <laughs> You know, one of my, my thoughts on that is, is democracy's uh, main uh, attribute that's good is not that it so much that it elects the good and the right people, but it allows you to get them out once they're in. And the uh, the uh, judicial system being changed to the Missouri plan or something like that is supposed to have some sort of panel that will get good people so the governor really couldn't make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And if, but if you leave it up to just running, it's whoever's got the most money, whoever can run the most negative ads. So, yeah, I, I think that's the benefit of the of the Missouri plan is you, that you hopefully you get good people in there. If you get a, a bad apple, you do have a way to vote them out. But I think the system we've had is just really atrocious. When I started practicing law, it wasn't like that at all. I had a good Supreme Court and plaintiff lawyers started out in about 1970. Two targets: the Supreme Court and the state the state senate, and they. Now control them. Why did they start out? They discovered a tremendous market. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen anybody that had fell into a pot of gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Willingly give it up. <laughs> <laughs> but it took them 20 years to do that. And it might take us 20 years to get out of it. But it's going in the right direction. <laughs> my first term, let me tell you how it works. My first term, court was never an issue. Never heard the word. And back in those days... And this wasn't that far back. It was early 80s. Uh, everybody thought Alabama's courts were very conservative, controlled by the utilities, the railroads. That's what, what everybody thought. Highly conservative courts. So, and this just, to me, this is funny. Uh, so, what they decided that they needed a statute that would get uh, in, in, in venue, in, in most of the cases back then were tried in Mobile or Birmingham or uh, Huntsville or Montgomery, you four urban areas. So they passed the law to, in, in order to be more conservative, Dean, to get the cases out in the rural districts. Hmm. This was a business community. Like Barbara Ken. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> they are in full retreat. They want to get out of Barber County and Green County <laughs> and back into Birmingham. So a bad law 
at first may may uh, appeal to the group that they think they're being favored by, but it's too edged so, particularly when you're dealing with a judiciary. A law has just got to be solid. Oh, it's going to come back to home to everybody. That's what we're living through. John's exactly right. I don't know where this tort reform thing. We're going to come with it. We're going to come with tort reform again. Welfare reform. Voter ID. Some campaign finance reform. And the budgets will be the, the major agenda of the session that starts February. Ballot access reform. <laughs> vote, ID, vote ID. No, ballot no, access. Ballot access. Oh. Let, let third parties have a better chance of getting on them. Yeah, initiative and referendum. Yeah. And third party. Third parties can get on there without too much trouble, can't they? Oh, it's easier to get on. It's easier for the Libertarian Party to get on in Russia than it is in Alabama. <laughs> I do need better so one of ballot access. I'm, I don't mind proposing uh, that ballot access. I thought we did that last year. I know we proposed initiative referendum. I thought we changed the ballot access a little bit. The governor asked me to present his initiative referendum program with legislature his first term. <laughs> and uh, while I was speaking on it, we had uh, initiative referendum and recall. That's right. We put the recall. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I was speaking to a joint session, and they began to yell, Hang him! <laughs> 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 Senator Denton from Florence stood up and he said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute now, this is a citizen of our state, he's entitled to be here, and uh, he's entitled to be heard, so let's all be quiet and uh, listen to him, and after he's through, we'll all hang him. <laughs> <laughs> One lesson in politics that I might pass on to you by citing a, a statement I heard a state senator make the other day, who's a friend of mine. And we were talking about some of the pressure-packed issues and how various politicians agree, uh, reacted to it. And I'm not going to call any names, but he was telling me about the chairman of FNT several years ago, which is the major finance committee in the Senate, finance and taxation. And this particular senator was, was having a difficult time making the decision which for the senator I was talking to saying the issue was clear cut. And he said he kept pressing him and badging and badging and he got more nervous and more nervous and how they excused themselves and went into a room. And the senator that was telling me the story asked the other senator this question. He says, what in the world is wrong with you on this issue? He says, I'll tell you the facts. I am heavily committed to both sides. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, I, I, we, re we really appreciate you committing some of your valuable uh, time and, and coming to Auburn and, and speaking to this uh, seminar. Fun and, to come home. Great. Thank you very much.